2009, we started hiring people. April 2009, we took our first venture round from Sequoia Capital. At that time, we had no idea if more than 1,000 people would ever use this, but we had this idea that maybe we'd solve this problem. I remember during a program I was in, Y Combinator, I had an advisor, Paul Graham. He had this mantra that really taught me about how to run a business. He said, make something people want. And the best way to make something people want is to find 100 customers that love you. By the way, that's really hard to find 100 people that actually love you. Most people don't have 100 people that actually love them. That's really hard. And he said, he used to say, it was better to have 100 people love you than a million people that sort of like you. It's kind of like a well. You can build this well of love, or you can build this really shallow pool, of this utility people kind of care about, kind of don't. If you have a million people that kind of are apathetic about you, it's going to be really hard to get them to care. But it's actually not hard to find 100 people and have them really love you as a company. Joe and I, in the, um, 2009, we used to go door to door in New York City, meeting all of these hosts, these people renting homes on our apartment. We even offered free professional photography. We'd photograph all the homes for free, except we'd had no money. So Joe and I were the free professional photographers. I'd get a camera from my friend, bring on the plane, I'd go and I'd go door to door, staying in people's homes. When you buy an iPhone, Steve Jobs never came and slept on your couch, but I did. That was my user acquisition strategy. I just stayed in everyone's homes. I gave them reviews. And then our friends, they gave reviews. And they're right. In 2010, I literally lived on the website. You know, the best way to make a product that people love is to make a product for yourself. We have a saying at Airbnb, the best marketing is investing in the user experience. And then your users will market for you. You know, at RISD, I had a teacher who used to say, advertising is the price you pay for being unoriginal. I don't know if I believe that, but I will tell you that you can build something. We, we always can build something that people love so much that they will tell everyone else they know about it. And what it really means is that we want to hire people that are here for our mission. We don't want people here because they think we've got a great valuation, they like our office design, they need a job, or they think it's hot. We want people to be here for the one thing that will never change, and that's our mission. And just to tell you a quick story about our mission, um, you know, Airbnb, you know, a lot of people describe it as a way to book a room or book a house and you travel around the world. And that's what we do. But that's not at all why we do it. And to answer the question of like what, what our mission is, I'll just tell you a quick story. And this, I think, describes it. In um, early 2012, I met a host named Sebastian. So we do these meetups around the world where we meet with hosts. And I meet this host named Sebastian. He's probably like late 50s. He lives in North London. And Sebastian looks at me and says, Brian, there's this word you never use in your website. And I said, what's that word? He said, that word is friendship. I would love to tell you the story about friendship. And I said, OK, tell me the story about friendship. He said, six months ago, the Rwandan riots broke out outside my home. And I was very scared. And the next day, my mom called me to make sure I was OK. And he said, yeah, mom, I'm OK. And she goes, what about the house? And he says, well, yeah, the house is OK as well. And he said, here's the interesting thing. Between the time the riots broke out and the time my mom called me was a 24-hour window of time. And in that period of time, he said, seven of my previous Airbnb guests called me just to make sure I was OK. He said, think about that. Seven of my guests called me from my own mother did. I don't know what that says about our guest or his mother more. But, <laughs> um, but in, in this summer, on a typical night or a peak night, we would have 425,000 pe 25, people staying in homes in living together, and they were coming from 190 countries in the world, which is every country but North Korea, Iran, Syria, and Cuba. So when you hear that story, at our core, what we're about, that's much more than just booking a room or traveling. What we are about is we want to help bring the world together. And we want to do that by giving a sense of belonging anywhere you go. So our mission is to belong anywhere. So five years from now, 20 years from now, maybe we're still selling rooms and homes, but maybe we're not. But I can guarantee you what we're always going to be about is this sense of belonging and bringing people together. And that's the more enduring idea. So when we hire people, the first thing we need to make sure is that if that's our mission, you need to champion that mission. You champion the mission by living the mission. Do you believe in it? Do you have stories about it? Have you used the product? Would you bleed for the product? I used to ask like crazy questions. Like one of the, the cr crazy questions Sam reminds me of is I used to interview people. So I interviewed the first 300 employees at Airbnb, which people think I'm like really neurotic, and that may also be true. But um, 
And I used to ask him a question, which I've now amended. I used to ask them, if you had a year left to live, would you take this job? And actually, the people who say yes to that, you probably don't want, because that's like, they should probably spend time with your family. So I amended it to <laughs> 10 years. Because I feel like you should, you, whatever, if you knew you had 10 years left to live, whatever you do want, you would do in those last 10 years, you should just do. And, and I really wanted people to think about that. That was enough time for like, you to do something you really cared about. And the answer doesn't have to be this company. And I say, fine, if the, what you're meant to do is to travel, or what you're meant to do is start a company, you should just do that. Don't come here. Go do that. And so there's this old kind of parable, probably many of you have heard of it, about like, two men are laying bricks. Somebody comes up to the first man and says, what are you doing? He says, I'm building a wall. He asks the other guy, what are you doing? He says, I'm building a cathedral. There is a job, and then there's a calling. And we want to hire people that aren't just looking for jobs, they're looking for a calling. And that's, that's kind of the first value, and that's championing the mission. And right. I want to provide a great experience. At the end of the day, I want to provide a meaningful trip every single time. And some of the trips are incredibly meaningful. I'll just tell you a quick story and then go to mm -hmm. questions. Um, I'll tell you a couple. One. <laughs> you just are really scared of questions. Yes, yeah, because I don't want questions, no. <laughs> I've already covered the methods. I know, I know. There's, a, there's, a, there's a, a guy named George. He's a, I believe he was from Berlin, and he's staying with a host. Um, and the host's name is Kai. And George is talking to Kai. Now, George and Kai are both probably like, in their 60s. Mm -hmm. And George is telling these stories about like how he was in the German army. And I think George was in West Germany. And it turns out that George was a guard at the border between the West and the East. And at all the, at all the, uh, all the um, guard posts, they like, essentially it's like North and South Korea, like people are like staring at each other, guards on both sides. So he's talking about this to this guy, Kai. It turns out Kai says, well, that's funny because I grew up in East Germany and I was also a guard and I was facing the other way. And so they're talking to each other and they realize like which guard posts were yet. They realized they were at the same guard post and they're like, well, when were you doing it? Mm -hmm. And they realize they were doing it at the same time. And then something overcomes George and he has these flashbacks and he realizes the person whose face he used to stare at that was the other was Kai. He used to look across the wall into this man's face, and this man was the enemy. Mm -hmm. And now this man was his host in his home. And I think there was something incredibly powerful about that idea, that what we're doing is bringing people together from around the world. <laughs> and tonight, around the world, people from over 170 countries are staying in other people's homes all over the world. And there's something incredibly powerful about that. And I think when that happens, that's a better world. That's the world I want to live in. And yes, there are going to be problems, and we have to adopt and change and learn. But there's something fundamentally good. You know, Mayor Willie Brown came and he spoke to Airbnb in San Francisco. And he says, when I grew up, I couldn't stay in hotels because of the Jim Crow law. Jim Crow law said that blacks couldn't stay in hotels because hotels are for whites only. So African Americans traveling around the United States stayed in other African Americans' homes because that was the only way they could travel. Mm -hmm. Southern hospitality, you ever go to someone's house in the South, you'll see pineapples in their bedpost. That is a sign of welcome. Mm -hmm. Hospitality, they say in hotels, welcome somebody as if they're in your home. Well, this mm -hmm. is an idea that's been happening for thousands of years. So I don't think this is a new idea, and I think there's something finally important about what we're doing. So. Mm -hmm. Um, all right, cool. Um, I want to ask you one more thing, and then I swear yeah. to God we're going to go to questions. Um, I, I read this fascinating story. I don't know if anyone else read it. Uh, maybe you all read it. I hadn't read it till today about Unfast Company, about how you like were really inspired by Walt Disney and basically like yeah. storyboarded the next phase yeah. of your of of the company. And like you guys went through this crazy brainstorming process where you like storyboarded out how like the different Airbnb experiences and it helped you like really like visualize what you were doing and like you even had like an animator from Pixar come in and I mean it like it just seems it's it's such a manifestation of of how you run the company based on vis like this visual yeah. design thinking that's right. like so unlike other companies right. so I'm curious if you could just tell us like you know a little bit about that and right. That's, it sounds like such a gimmick from the outside, but what did you really discover during that? In the winter of 2011, we were faced with 
we had started to become successful. We came out of the wake of all these challenges and we were growing and it was like, no, nope, we're still growing really mm -hmm. fast. What should we do next? Should we go into cars, the Airbnb cars, mm -hmm. event space, co-working space? There were all these like potential roads and paths and opportunities. We didn't know what to do. And I remember us like sizing the market for cars and like, oh, we can make this much money. And then I go home for Christmas and I realize I'm asking like all the wrong questions. Who cares? Like, the only thing that really matters is like, what does a customer really want? What does our guest want? Yeah. And again, it was part of like what I learned over time, just focus on delivering an amazing experience. And then I was thinking back to what I, my background as industrial designer. Industrial design, by the way, Apple designs the end-to-end -end experience and we call it this magical thing Apple does. It's just a design thing. Design an end-to-end -end experience. That's all it is. Mm -hmm. Pay, follow the user through the entire journey of using that. Mm -hmm. That's not new. I didn't invent that. That's been going on for as long as design's been happening. Well, we came back and I said, I, I, I actually, I was, I was reading this biography about Walt Disney and I get to the chapter about Snow White and it was like the same stage Airbnb at that time, like same amount of employees, they were working out of apartments, this and that. And Walt wanted to create a story that people loved. I want to create a trip people love and trips are like stories. Right. And, and he wanted to do something that was a full movie and not just, right. yeah. Exactly, not just like this little thing. I want to design this entire thing. And Walt said, I want to create a movie that people care about. And the way I know they'll care about it is they'll cry because you only care about, cry about things you care about. And so the movie was so long, he's going to make a fe feature and movie, he created this thing called the storyboard. And that's when the light bulb went off in my head and I said, what if we were to storyboard the perfect experience? What if every trip in Airbnb was like this movie? And Airbnb the movie, every movie could be a fairy tale or a horror film mm -hmm. or a documentary, a docudrama, something mm -hmm. in between. I want every trip on Airbnb to be like a fairy tale. And if I do that, I got to pretend like I'm Walt Disney and I got to design the perfect story frame by frame. Mm -hmm. And when we did it, we actually, first we did it with like post-it notes and then we did crappy sketches and I, I felt like it wasn't really resonating. So we ended up finding a Pixar storyboard artist. He came in, he designed it with vivid detail. And like you, when, you have to, when you do something in really crisp detail, you have to like make a whole bunch of decisions. Like was it a man or a woman? If it's a stick figure, it doesn't have right. to be a man or a woman. Well, how old is she? Where is she from? You have to like start answering all these questions. So it really clarifies your thinking. A huge insight happened from this. We used to think the product was the website. Mm -hmm. It turns out our product is not our website. Our product are the homes. Our product is the community. That's what you're buying. Our website is just the store and the way you communicate with the product. And we had realized we weren't even doing anything to design this offline experience. It was an incredibly clear moment for us. If people ask, it's not a secret like what we're going to do in the future. What we're going to do in the future is try to own the entire trip mm -hmm. and make sure that every frame of that trip is incredibly powerful, memorable, and maybe once in a while, like the two guys in Berlin, even life changing. Maybe not all the time, but once in a while. That's an incredibly important like, way that we think about the company. And so it's frame by frame, and we also try to do it inside out. We try to do it internally for the company first, and then we do it outside. What does that mean you're going to control the trip? Are you going to organize flights, like <coughs> tour buses? Like, what does that mean? How you get to a listing is a frame. And if, if we can't add something to that frame, we won't do it. Mm -hmm. And flights and getting to cities, the amount of effort would be to like fix that problem, like given like, it, so that's probably a frame we're not gonna fix, but maybe, maybe we can like, if, you, if you're here and you're trying to go to Sacramento, maybe we'll tell you the best way to get there. I don't know. Yeah. That's definitely not a frame we're focused on right now. What we are focused on is checking the checkout. Mm -hmm. When you walk in the listing, if you like, love apple pie, there's an apple pie like waiting in your kitchen table. And maybe it's because the host was just educated that this is the person, provide a higher level of service, or maybe eventually there's a service that, that can do that. Right. And the service can fill in when the host isn't able to fill that level of hospitality. Mm. It all comes back to we want to create experience that is incredibly meaningful, incredibly memorable for our guests. The best word of mouth, the best marketing is just word of mouth. If people love you, they'll talk about you. And so we think that's our North Star. Right. Oh God, how did I raise money? Um, it was not pretty. Um, in, in 2008, I met um, a guy named Michael Seibel. And he told me that there were these people called angels. And the first thing I thought was, oh my God, this guy's insane. He believes in angels. <laughs> and he goes, no, they're angel investors. 
You could have, they'll write you $20,000 checks over dinner. And I was, for, then I thought, wait, I lived in LA. That's not a good sign when somebody does that to you. <laughs> and, I go, and he goes, no, 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 you just got to have a slide deck. And I'm like, what's a slide deck? And it was, uh, and he said, well, go to this website. There's 15 slides and y there's a whole process to doing it. So we end up, you know, creating Airbnb. And then Michael introduces us to like 20 investors. And I actually, he, he, he emailed us, like he gave us all these intros. So basically the way, the best way to get funding isn't to randomly reach out to an investor, but get somebody who that investor trusts to validate you and give you an introduction. So that's what Michael did. And he did it like 20 times. This was huge. And he, inv and he basically said like, I don't know if anyone's going to fund you, but if they are, it's going to be one of these 20 people, which basically told me that if one of these 20 people didn't fund us, we're never going to get funded. And he gives us intros. 10 of them never replied to the emails. And I wrote them like two or three times. I'd never heard from them. The other like five or six of them replied. And they said, you know, I actually saved a lot of the emails. And, um, and, and the emails were variations of, you know, we struggled with funding people that weren't engineers. We don't, we can't, one person said, we just can't get excited about travel. <laughs> that was crazy. <laughs> Another person, I was like, really? Wow, where do you go? Um, another person said, the travel market, the travel industry is not big enough. It's not large enough. Meanwhile, it's approximately the size of the oil industry. So it's actually fairly large. Um, but there were excuse after excuse. The one first meeting we had with an investor was in a cafe. It was a cafe called University Cafe on University Avenue, which was near Stanford. And so probably similar to one of the cafes around here. And an investor sits down at a chair. Joe and I are pitching him. He's like, he orders a smoothie. He's drinking a smoothie. At no point in the presentation does he lift his head up. In other words, he's got his head on a straw like, uh-huh, 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 just nodding like the, the whole time. And we thought this was kind of strange. But we proceeded to kind of keep going. And we're like, just, just roll with it. Maybe this is a good sign. He's enjoying it. All of a sudden, he gets up and he leaves. <laughs> And we thought he was parking his car. But I haven't seen him since, so <laughs> unless he got really lost. So all that is to say, we were trying to raise $150,000. And we were going to raise, we're at a $1.5 uh, million valuation. Which means that we were trying to sell 10% of the company, which today would have been worth a few billion dollars for $150,000. And nobody wanted that investment. So we didn't actually raise money in the early days. And so then we ended up doing what Joe and I like to joke was the visa round. You know, there's just that visa didn't know about it. We just kept <laughs> taking out Visa and MasterCard credit cards. <laughs> and I don't know, in, in the United States, kids used to collect, we used to collect baseball cards, maybe you do like football cards and sleeves, those plastic sleeves, you know. We put credit cards in those because we had that many credit cards. We literally would be like a stack. And each of us went tens of thousands of dollars into credit card debt. And then in late, um, late 20, uh, 20, 2008, everyone's got a, st I think every entrepreneur's got a story about rock bottom. In late 2008, I hit rock bottom. Um, I was in the kitchen late at night with Joe, and we came to the realization that we, a year into the concept about air bed and breakfast, we had made, I think, $1,000 in revenue or something like that with our air beds. In other words, we weren't making a lot of money. We thought, air bed and breakfast. Air beds aren't making any money. Maybe breakfast will be more profitable for us. <laughs> so I know what you're thinking. Brilliant, right? Uh, and so we, we think, what if we sold a breakfast cereal? Because the only breakfast you can sell is a non-perishable, like a breakfast cereal. And so it was during the summer of 2008. In the United States, the thing happening in the summer of 2008 was the election of Barack Obama against John McCain. And so we provided housing for the Democratic and Republican National Conventions, and we decided to do presidential theme cereal. So we did a Barack Obama theme cereal. It was, we picked Cheerios, and we called it Obama O's, <laughs> the breakfast of change. And we thought, well, if we're gonna have an Obama theme cereal, we have to have a John McCain theme cereal. So we had a cereal called, we found out he was a captain in the Navy, and so we named his cereal Cap McCain's a maverick in every bite. 
and we had a blue box for Obama and a red box for John McCain. And of course, we're about to make like cereal. We call up Kellogg's and they pick up the phone and I think they thought we were mentally ill. <laughs> so they hung up the phone because you just don't call them with ideas like that. Long story short is that we didn't have any money. We ended up finding a former RISD grad who prints us. He says, I don't have any money, but I'm going to print you 500 boxes each of Obama O's and Cap McCain's. He prints us these boxes. No one told me that they would just be giant pieces of poster board. I have to fold in hot glue myself with Joe. It was like I was doing giant origami. I had to do it with hot glue. They should call it burn glue. And I had a perfect one-to-one -one ratio of burn to box. And I'm literally hot gluing at like midnight in a random like October night cereal boxes. And we're stuffing boxes of cereal in. And there's long story short is we end up selling $30,000 worth of collectible breakfast cereal. And that was our first round of funding. <laughs> and, and so now we say we have a core value. It's to be a serial entrepreneur. <laughs> Bad joke. But whenever now in the company, because you know, we have a lot of capital now, somebody says, they, I need more money. I don't have a big enough budget. It's amazing to be able to say, well, let me tell you about a time I didn't have any money. And it's, a, it's pretty easy. The third is simplify. I think that probably speaks for itself. And, it wouldn't be simplifying if I expanded on it. Um, <laughs> um, you know, there's something kind of weird about, um, you know, I, 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 oh, I never love being part of the status quo or the establishment. That becomes clear. Yeah. But eventually, you know, we have, we're going to pretty soon have two million homes, and pretty soon we will become part of the establishment and we will become, a, in, a, in a sense, the status quo. And the company itself will become the status quo. And so there's this weird conflict I have where that's not really in my nature. Because my nature is I always, you know, I went to RISD, and I had a teacher that told me, Brian, you're a designer. Everything around you could be desi it was designed by other people. You can redesign the world you live in. So I'm constantly obsessed with redesigning things and reinventing things. So now I have a, we have this company we've designed and so if I could change one thing, it's really kind of, I mean, this is kind of weird, but like what I'm really interested in is Airbnb 2.0. And, and it's really continued to transform the company. You know, we're in the technology industry, and one definition of technology is change. So our core competency has to be, we have to be willing to change and not be viewed as static. And I think eventually, in many ways, we're all in the technology industry because we all use technology. And so what I'm really interested in, and what I'm actually working on changing, is continue to shift Airbnb from spaces to experiences. So in other words, you don't go to a city to stay in a home. You go to a city to have experiences. So today you go to Airbnb, and you can go to Paris, and you can stay in 60,000 homes. But that's the limit of Airbnb in Paris today. And I hope tomorrow, when you go to Paris, not only can you get a home, but you can you know, you can pr get experiences provided th throughout the entire city on Airbnb. And so I think that's w what I'm most interested in doing, is redefining what it means to be a, a host. And a host in the future isn't just somebody who offers a home. A ho host is somebody who offers a service or hospitality in a city. And once you change your mindset about that, there's 30, 40, 50 types of ways people can host in a city, not just with their home. And that's probably the thing I'm most excited about changing.